Okay, very good morning to you. Monday, the 20th of April. Hope everyone had a, a great weekend. Uh, going to go through not just the, the kind of situation as it stands right now, but have a bit of a look over the week ahead. What are the key things that we're looking out for? Um, to the side of me here, you can see a blog called The Macro Menu. So anyone new to this channel, uh, please do like and subscribe to the video, first of all, for, for daily updates for, for me and the team. But also every Sunday, I basically publish a report called The Macro Menu, which is my kind of fundamental view about the week ahead and some of the key issues that I'm looking at. So um, some of the things, just to give you an overview uh, that I've looked at, uh, this week is the economic reality kind of hitting home in regard to more economic data coming out this week, specifically the PMI data I'm quite interested to look at. Uh, that's coming out from pretty much every major economy around the world this week, including the US and the Eurozone, as well as the UK. And then we've got initial jobless claims. People are still going to be looking at that. And I was reading a couple of things over the weekend, and what I thought was you know, a, a, just a quite striking number was that Oxford Economics... Uh, we're talking about in their research report that they're looking for uh, non-farm payrolls for eight, the month of April, so that we'll get at the beginning of May. They're looking for a number of around minus 25 million. Um, obviously, mathematically, it does make sense, just given the, the scope, as this graphic would suggest, of the kind of averaging of the initial jobless claims that we've had. But uh, again, a quite a stark contrast to what we had in the global financial crisis where the worst one-off print was only around 800,000. Uh, the number we can expect for non-farms in a few weeks' time could be a negative 25 million, which would be uh, absolutely unprecedented at that type of scale. A lot of that stuff, though, uh, I guess is priced in as, as sensational as it is. So uh, forward-looking things that are going to be quite key are the manufacturing service PMI numbers. We've already seen those in the Eurozone last month pretty much drop off a cliff so it's about well, how how pessimistic are people about the the future going forward uh, also some other things I, I touch upon in this which I think perhaps could be quite interesting to have a look at um, was I, I kind of talk about this slow path back to normality this idea about the kind of elimination of a quick bounce in a v-shape it's going to be much more long and protracted than that and I think the kind of balance at this point, particularly when the focus now is about unwinding the lockdown, I think keeping a track on the testing volumes in different countries, and there's different ways you can look at this, but I guess here I've got a chart of total tests uh, for COVID-19 per 1,000 people rather than an actual cumulative total, obviously different in uh, population sizes and so on. Um, some other things, uh, again, Donald Trump kind of politically, I talk about uh, some European stuff and then oil. Uh, and that's going to be a bit of a focal point for what we're going to talk about in the briefing this morning. Um, because we've got the expiration of the May contract coming tomorrow. Uh, we can expect more volatility going into that expiration. Uh, prices we'll have a look at in a moment because we're in quite extreme contango at the moment. And I'll explain what exactly that means. Um, but the main thing is oil is down and uh, certainly we've maintained a pretty bearish view ever since OPEC struck that accord, what, almost two weeks ago now. Um, we've always felt that the, uh, the kind of immediacy of the um, huge supply shock that we're going under, given the, the, the lockdown was so immediate globally, uh, that OPEC's action uh, was going to do little to offset that, at least in the near term. So. Yeah, that's coming to fruition a little bit now and, uh, and it's something we can we can delve into a bit more. So yeah, this macro menu, the other thing that's probably quite useful, there's an earnings kind of snapshot of who are the key people coming out. Uh, and then we've got a calendar of, of events, which we'll, we'll have that here now and we'll circle back and we'll close with this for this uh, briefing this morning. Uh, and I'll run you through a few highlights. Uh, but yeah, if you need that, uh, obviously my Twitter handle is here. Uh, I do post that on Twitter on Sunday afternoon generally when I get it out um, and it can mean a nice thing to complement your just general technical analysis that you, you do getting ready for the week ahead. Um, also as well, for those uh, interested, the Amplify Now kind of e-learning portal, uh, I'll put a link into the video description, uh, but Sam did quite a cool thing yesterday that he's going to do going forward um, where he did a basically like a, a weekly trade setup um, video and so that's going to be particularly useful as well to kind of complement what I talk about on the fundamentals um, he's going to be talking about so here his kind of week ahead outlook I think he did the S&P and the euro uh, so something to check out as well 
but let's have a quick look at the charts before we get through uh, the headlines. And fairly muted open, uh, to be honest, comparative to some of the big gaps in price that we have been seeing over the last couple of weeks. Um, equity index futures, a little bit mixed overnight in Asia. Um, US stock futures are trading a little lower this morning. Uh, we're down about 122 in the Dow, 13, 14 points in the S&P. Uh, the DAX, off its most extreme levels on the upside, it has pared down a little bit, albeit still up about 100 and sitting just above its pivot at the moment, uh, but just running into a little bit of resistance uh, at around just before Europe came in, kind of a double touch on that level just short of R1 um, at around 10.764 failing at the moment and we're just within that kind of that's the top end of the range also encapsulating some of the highs that we saw at the back end of last week uh, and the downside to pivot at the moment fx markets the dixie's a little bit firmer we're up about a third of a percent at the moment um, which is putting a little bit down would pressure since europe's come in on the major fx pairs uh, consequently both just managing to just break out of that kind of consolidation hugging the pivot level in the futures overnight so a bit of a, a follow through to the downside here in both euro dollar and cable uh, gold not too much movement again pretty quiet in the overnight session and, and just hugging 1700 before then just a little bit of downside uh, just seen here more recently T notes up about five ticks uh, but crude probably a little bit of a focal point uh, and we're going to start with that in terms of a bit of a conversation. Um, this is the headline people are looking at. I'm going to run through a few different things. Um, the headline on Bloomberg, uh, obviously Bloomberg are going to want to make this as sensational as possible. So often when you're reading media at the moment, they are referring to the May contract, not the June contract. But from a trader's point of view, um, the, the role has already happened. So... Uh, the effective front month, which is where the volume is now, is and has been June for a little while now. So it, you really should be focusing more on that than the than the May print. Um, because if you actually look at it at the moment, if we go back to my chart, this is the June contract, which is trading. It's had a little bit of a bounce here. Um, it saw some quite extreme volatility in the overnight session. You can see that extremity of the wick here actually printed down at a low of 22.71 uh, but we're just recovering up towards 24 at the moment albeit still down just over a dollar uh, so that's trading at 23.87 in June May is trading down as you can see it has been trading down at sub 15 uh, so quite a big disparity between the two contracts um, can tango structure the futures market where contracts then for the for the latter months uh, delivery trade at a pre premium to the, the current uh, first contract, which, which would be May at this point. Uh, the May contract for WTI um, is trading about, well, you can see it there, it's about an $8 lower than the June contract, near the record 8.5 spread between the first and second months that were set back in uh, December of 2008. Um, so a couple of things to bear in mind here then with oil to explain what this could mean from a trading perspective. One, um, the headline saying that wild oil markets set for extra volatility as contracts expiry near. Now the extra volatility could well be in part because of the fact that you have got such a big divergence between these two calendar months. Um, crude stockpiles at Cushing. So Cushing is that main kind of hub in Oklahoma where it's the delivery point then upon expiration of oil. Uh, and the problem you've got there is that stockpiling at Cushing is jumped about 48% to almost 55 million barrels since the end of February, according to the IEA. So this market oversupply situation, of which has led to this action from OPEC, isn't a new thing. It's been happening for a while. Uh, remember, there were concerns as well about trade war and, uh, and so on before we got into this latest pandemic situation. Um, so concerns continue to mount that storage facilities in the U.S. will run out of capacity. So if you think about it, then everyone looking to get out and sell out of their May contract. And that's just forced that that first calendar month contract lower and widened then out the, the, the spread between the, the two contracts. Uh, hence the reason why you know this is happening at the moment. Uh, another interesting stat here, though, crude explorers. Uh, shut down about 13% of U.S. drilling fleet last week as the swelling worldwide glut of crude spurred drastic cost-cutting 
and project cancellations among drillers. And you know, this was one of the things here. I'm just going to flip this to this chart. Um, this was f a previous annotations from a conversation I was having with a uh, with a group a few weeks ago. Uh, and as you can see, I've got these three arrows or four arrows here. And you know, when we were having the conversation a few weeks ago, this was back in uh, March. Uh, and this is when we were testing that lower bound level of around the Feb. And, you know, remember the market was responding to that technical point of support a little bit, but we always thought that, you know, just given uh, the the size and scope of the demand shock on the back of the coronavirus, that uh, we felt that OPEC, even if they were going to implement as they have done a record agreement, is probably going to do little in the immediate period to offset then um, this this. Uh, um, in balance between supply and demand. So prices have come down and the, the, the big point here now is that we managed to get our heads below then that November 2001 low. Uh, so I'm looking at a monthly continuation now here and this then does bring in that, that front month or, or May contract. Uh, and that's why you can see that break then of that key level here. Uh, but the idea being that you know, as we go down, now technically one point is when we break these long standing levels that can exert then further downward pressure. And that can then, if you look here, there's not a great deal of, of, of the next kind of clear point it doesn't come down till, you know, kind of a 1035 area, which doesn't eliminate that from becoming a, a possibility. But one of the things I talk about in the macro menu, one of the things that I'm quite keen to watch is this idea, and I, I talk about it here if you're interested. Now, I just explained that crude explorers shut down 13% of US drilling fleet last week alone. Since mid-March, basically, US rig count has dropped about 250. It's probably even more than that by now. Uh, and that's around 30%. So around, well, over now, 30% of operational rigs in America have just come offline as a natural reaction to the fact that these drillers need to cut costs. It becomes no longer economically viable to operate, and so therefore naturally US oil production is going to decrease quite rapidly. My feelings of why I've remained quite bearish is that that is true, and that is a statistic to monitor, but ultimately that takes a little while for it to really kick in. Uh, and so, these arrows I've got here is ultimately, I think then once these oil producing uh, country, I think OPEC compliance is going to be uh, strong because it's in their interest for it to be that way. Uh, but then uh, I also think that the natural uh, reduction in production is going to see uh, prices in the second half of this year. So I think it's gonna be in the next two, three months it will start commencing and thereafter, we will get a distinct bounce in prices. So if you are thinking about that longer term opportunity, it definitely is coming. Uh, and I think you definitely will see a meaningful recovery. And you think about it, if we're trading down at $10, you know, a move back to 20 bucks, well, I think you're looking more like a move like 26 or back up to, uh, kind of forty dollars would be more of a longer term target. You know, to twenty six, you're looking at a hundred and thirty seven percent gain. Back up to forty, you're looking at a gain of two hundred and sixty three percent. So, you know, these could be great long term investments if you were looking at say cash equities, a couple of oil majors like Exxon, for example, or if you're just riding out, uh, you know, kind of a. a structured trade in reflection then from the macro view that generally oil is going to respond in time as we get over the worst of the coronavirus and that situation starts to improve going forward. Um, so yeah, just so I'd go into that in a little bit more detail. Obviously any questions just let me know in the, uh, in the chat room or on the, the video, I'd be happy to help. All right. Let's, let's get on with a few other things then. So that's oil, and I definitely think oil is, it, it could be, if it does continue to see more aggressive downside, a bit of a, uh, something to watch for equity traders, uh, given the fact that you know we've kind of been in a fairly bullish mood recently. Could that be the straw that breaks the, the rallies back in that respect? So something to just be aware of. Um, quick update on the coronavirus. Uh, this is that FT graphic looking at the kind of uh, daily death 
with coronavirus on a seven day rolling average. And you can see here uh, quite a lot of these European hotspots continuing to, to come lower. Uh, fewer daily deaths reported in Italy, Spain and the UK. Uh, I'm glad to report. Uh, the New York governor, Andrew Como said the state may be past the high point of the coronavirus deaths and obviously that's an important one as well because that's the kind of epicenter of the outbreak in, in North America. Um, one article though that did come out over the weekend that did uh, catch a bit of attention was in the Telegraph. Uh, they were citing the World Health Organization who was saying that there's no evidence that people who have survived coronavirus have immunity. Now this is quite a significant thing if it is proven to be true because if you remember even what the UK government's stance was at the beginning it was you know Boris was of that mindset of kind of herd protection it was like everyone should get it and then therefore there will be casualties I'm sure he's regretting saying these things now um, but he was saying then we can build up a, a, a herd immunity and we can move uh, forward much quicker and therefore we can uh, get the economy still working and that's going to mean lesser people losing their jobs it's going to be less economic impact and so on but obviously you know things have changed radically for the UK government because of the cost of life that has been seen um, so antibody tests may be ineffective at showing if a patient is immune to the virus or for how long antibodies might give protection so this is definitely something to monitor because going forward and one of the things I talk about in that week ahead kind of blog is about this idea of now um, how our company how our country is going to unwind the lockdown I think that's the next big uh, talking point that's going to come um, now Boris Johnson obviously coming out of intensive care he's now kind of getting back into these meetings now um, as it's been kind of chaired here by Dominic Rabb in his replacement over the last couple of weeks. Um, but Johnson does face quite a stiff challenge at the moment because there was a couple of reports, I'm not sure if you saw in the Sunday Times and the FT, that were very critical of the government's handling of the coronavirus at the beginning under his stewardship because if you remember, Boris, I think, was on holiday with his girlfriend at the time when everything was outbreak in China was happening um, generally the UK was one of the slowest to respond in terms of some of the measures that were taken a lot of the protective gear as well um, was very late coming we actually sent quite a lot of that to China originally uh, we, only we only requested help from other businesses to provide that type of equipment in April uh, and obviously that was very late in the game where they offered assistance two months earlier so yeah there's a lot of negative press reports about the government's handling but I guess what's important now then is about what do we do going forward and apparently the cabinet is very split at the moment. Um, basically uh, Michael Gove and the Chancellor Sunak and, and definitely you can understand the latter, they kind of want to relax the lockdown as soon as they can really because you know if you're the Chancellor obviously you're, you're quite economic oriented in terms of your, your agenda and he knows that the implications of a lockdown have a severe impact on the UK economy. So the quicker we can get things back into, into play, uh, the quicker we can start addressing uh, that, that kind of the scope of the downturn or the size of it, but also the speed of the recovery. On the opposite side, though, um, Hancock has said he wants to wait until the virus is kind of defeated first. And apparently he has backings from Dominic Cummings, which we know has some sway uh, behind closed doors over these decisions that get made on a cabinet level. So yeah, this is what's going to be key to watch. A couple things that I've seen over the weekend. Um, this was one when there's a reported kind of, in, in America, it's also been talked about in the UK about a three-stage process of, of unwinding lockdown. And this is what some of the speculation was suggesting, a red, amber, green phase. Uh, and the, the, con the subsequent dates. So the red phase being that small non-essential shops can reopen, warehouses, nurseries, hairdressers, and so on. God knows I need a haircut coming soon. Um, but that would be on May 11th. Then the amber phase being small businesses uh, with up to 50 staff can reopen. That might not be until the end of May. Um, social distancing measures are then lifted or some. And then the green phase 
is then when cinemas, theatres, comedy clubs, sports venues reopen, pubs. So if you think about it, those more kind of uh, areas where there'd be kind of mass gatherings in that sense. That wouldn't be till June. But uh, basically Downing Street has been pretty quick to come out and flat deny this. I think probably the worst thing that they can do now is really commit to specific dates in time because ultimately that's probably not going to be met. Um, and I would say my opinion at this point, I would say... I agree with the approach in a staggered fashion because we do need to reopen the economy as soon as possible. Uh, but I think these dates are a little bit optimistic yeah, in my view. But this is what's going to be quite quite key going forward is the timeline and how this is executed and then how successfully we, we hit these timelines uh, as to then um, the, the kind of impact on markets going forward. From a US point of view, Trump's kind of getting involved and, and the US are looking to, to throw more money at the issue. A uh, relief deal for the US small businesses may come as soon as today, according to President Trump at the weekend. So this is a kind of top up on that, um, that big package that they delivered a few weeks ago. Uh, and I did see this and I thought I'd share. This is the, the fiscal support. I just wanted to give it a bit of context of what we've been seeing just generally. Uh, this is looking at government spending as a percentage of GDP. Uh, and it's just quite mind-blowing, really, when you look at um, the COVID-19 response. And this is why a lot of people, although there is a bit of a split in opinion, a growing number of people are getting fairly bullish about equities at this point, given the fact of the unprecedented steps that the, F the Federal Reserve, global central banks have taken, but in combination with this um, fiscal spending, which if you look at it here, kind of three times the size of the financial crisis and way more steeper trajectory in terms of injecting its money straight in. Uh, and it, you know, you'd be looking at the kind of scope and scale of what we've seen on these, these previous types of occasions in terms of its percentage of GDP uh, at that point. So that and you know another thing to be aware of when we start hearing these numbers, everyone's obviously quite fearful about how how much of a contraction generally economies are going to see in the second quarter, which is going to take the brunt of this kind of uh, COVID-19 impact. But the dispersion in GDP quarterly gross forecast, the gap between the 25th and the 75th percentile um, is massive. You know, it's very hard for an, an economics team to basically calculate the GDP impact when it's just been so violent, the movement in, in the data set, and it's so wide ranging, and they're seeing such volatile variance, it means that trying to accurately predict then GDP has led to this monster range that we would be, we, you know, we'd normally see um, in any normal time would be less than 1%. And we're looking here kind of up to 17% at this point. Um, so, yeah, try, you know, when you hear these, these, uh, press reports and they talk about you know GDP is expected at X basically you've got to give that a very wide berth either side as to where that might come out but that does translate then from a trading point of view it's probably going to take quite a lot to shock the market because the the ranges are going to be very large so it's got to be probably pretty spectacular on either side to really move the needle given we've got a bigger kind of buffer uh, in that sense um, <laughs> one thing I did see this morning um, was this, and this was talking about um, uh, virus hit Brexit talks. I mean, you know, if you can, if you can remember, there was a thing called Brexit uh, that kind of was the talking point of literally every briefing I gave for the entirety of kind of Q4. I remember of last year going into the election, uh, but actually, after kind of it got parked for several weeks, uh, Britain and Europe will restart talks on Monday over the future relationship. And officials will meet by video conference for a full week of discussions this week. So you might get a few little uh, comments, if you like, about Brexit. Um, until the end of June, either side can, of course, ask for a transition period to be extended for a period of up to two years, um, subject to the other's consent. Uh, obviously, the economic disruption of Brexit and the coronavirus combined uh, it's probably more than likely they're going to have to call for extra time at this point, given that, as I said, that extension request, they've only got about another um, two months 
uh, to make that call. Two further video conference rounds are or have been arranged the 11th of May and the 1st of June, um, but I'd say there's just some such more important um, kind of facing issue in the form of the virus uh, at the moment. I don't think the governments are going to be too caught up in the Brexit stuff for the moment. Boris obviously playing the card that he has to play and he's been pretty adamant that we're not going to request an extension. He's going to deliver Brexit. But I think that's just then he's going to have to take this down as he normally does to the wire and I would, I would expect that uh, submission of request to extend probably this summer. Um, the final point on that kind of the government side was uh, central bank officials have held earlier talks with European Commission on setting up a Eurozone bad bank that would take billions of euros in debt off lenders' balance sheets, according to the FT this morning. Uh, this comes after Politico the weekend on Sunday reported that Europe will need to find another half a trillion euros to finance the economic recovery from COVID-19. This comes after they kind of approved with gritted teeth that previous um, amount of around 540 billion euros just a week ago. Uh, and it's raised this idea of a recovery fund. And obviously a lot of that comes then through this idea of uh, kind of shared debt issuance or euro bonds. And that's come under very firm resistance. Uh, and so countries like, obviously, I heard Spain this morning uh, are requesting some pretty sizable numbers that would have to be kind of backstopped in that kind of Eurozone together format. Uh, Italy, probably their, um, their country in terms of their yields and fixed income, BTPs, will probably be very volatile to the outcome of some of these teleconference conversations of European officials that are happening on Thursday. Uh, any further pushback on this idea of uh, of how they're going to finance this recovery fund or indeed actually getting more funds into the pot from a fiscal point of view in a coordinated fashion, all the more risk there are to, to, to BTPs in that fashion. Um, final thing is earnings. Uh, during the upcoming week, we've got about 96 S&P 500 companies reporting, six of the Dow 30 components. Uh, you can see here a couple of the, the main ones that I'd probably be most interested in. After market today, you've got IBM, Tomorrow pre-market, Coca-Cola, uh, Netflix, of course. You probably read a lot about them, obviously, on lockdown. Um, a lot of people a lot of people getting involved with Joe Exotic and the Tiger King. Uh, it's been incredibly popular. Um, but Netflix will likely be one in the spotlight to see how they've uh, potentially outperformed in this type of environment with the pickup of their services. Um, there's a couple of airlines <coughs> stocks which I think will be quite fascinating to watch as well, uh, just given the, uh, the ramifications of just the, the complete halt of global air travel. Uh, and I want to see what that looks like then on the actual numbers and outlook for the likes of Delta and Southwest Airlines. They're coming out on Wednesday and Thursday pre-market. Uh, then you've got companies like Eli Lilly on Thursday, Intel, and then on Friday, Verizon and Amer American Express are probably some of the larger market cap names that are coming out. But uh, this full table is available in that macro menu, um, and I will put the link to this report uh, in the video. Uh, but other than that, finishing off, what have we got for the rest of the week from a data perspective? So just giving you the summary of highlights. Uh, so today, as per usual, it's relatively quiet on a Monday from, from scheduled things. IBM is aftermarket, though. From Tuesday to overnight, so by this time tomorrow, we will have the Australian RBA minutes. Um, we also start to get um, some UK data in on the unemployment rate and employment change um, for the US existing home sales. Um, going into Wednesday, data-wise, you've got UK inflation metrics, so CPI, PPI, RPI. Uh, and then Thursday is when it gets kind of more interesting. That's when we start to get the, the kind of drop of the major um, manufacturing and service PMIs. And these are the flash readings. They will be important. Um, you've got Australia and Japan overnight. You then get um, France, Germany, Eurozone and the UK uh, later on on that, that uh, morning with the US in the afternoon alongside new home sales. And then Friday... Um, we've got UK retail sales, of course, um, expecting uh, pretty much record numbers. I think last week 
Remember the UK or the US retail sales came in uh, at a minus just over 8% reading, quite close to consensus, but still the lowest reading since the records began back in 1991. Um, UK retail sales, although there might be an, an, a bit of kind of infantry building or stockpiling that consumers were doing going into the eventual lockdown, which came around um, kind of mid-March, at the end of the day, that number is going to be pretty dire. So uh, probably not going to be too much of a surprise, but definitely uh, head, headline worthy at that point. So that'll be coming with the S&P also due to deliver an update review on the sovereignty of the UK, uh, which could be quite interesting as well. Uh, so that is it. That is the briefing for this morning. Um, any questions, though, just let me know. I'd be happy to help. Uh, and as I said, if you're not subscribed to the channel on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button. I'll appreciate it. All right. Have a good day and a good week ahead. Catch you guys tomorrow. Thanks.